Welcome to Dodgers Dogs. I'm Casey Porter, joined by Chase Witwiska, as I am each and every week. Chase, we have a very, very busy show tonight, a fun show. We're going to talk about the roles of Miguel Vargas, or Miguel Vargas, I told you I was going to do that, <laughs> Miguel Rojas, as he's come over to the Dodgers, the mentorship that he can give some of the young infielders. And we're also going to talk about the offense of J.D. Martinez and and whether that's going to, you know, kind of replace the the, the entire role that Justin Turner, you know, one of the things that we talked about was the mentorship Turner could bring to young guys and the offense. So I think combined between those two, maybe you get that entire role that Justin Turner would have had. So, Chase, welcome on in. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the show. All right. And also in our feature cut session of this show, we're going to break down the Dodgers minor league pitcher of the year, Gavin Stone. And I am so pumped, Chase. I have a chance to, I'm going to get the chance to talk to him on Friday afternoon. And so for all the fans out there who want to ask a question to Gavin Stone, just leave a comment and I will get that question to Gavin on Friday and we'll get that in. So excited about talking about Gavin Stone. Yeah, I am as well. He's a high caliber guy and obviously, you know, he's he's shown a lot of success in the minor league level and I think that you're going to see him play some sort of role um, here at the big club in 2023. No doubt about a young man who came from a small town, uh, Lake Lake City, Arkansas, and had a huge vision. And I know you know Coach Harlan there at UCA. You've actually recruited a couple kids to Central Arkansas. Went to Central Arkansas there in Conway, Arkansas. And actually in 2020, his last start for them, he was part of that five-round 2020 draft class. I believe drafted in the fifth round of that year. His last outing in 2020 was a no-hitter. So... Excited to talk about Gavin Stone, no doubt about that. So, hey, let's get to our news topic tonight. Good evening, Austin. Good evening, Frankie. Good evening, Orlando. Cannot wait to go over this show. Okay, so one of the big things that that I think if you follow me on social media or Chase, that we were worried about with not having Justin Turner on the roster, obviously, is the mentorship that he brings. We do know that he's getting a little bit older, so the defense, you know, he's probably going to DH a little bit more. Okay, so I was worried about about the mentorship that he could give, say, a Miguel Vargas, a Michael Bush, even a James Altman, and then at the time, a Jacob Amaya. Okay, so I think one of the big things that that was appealing about Miguel Rojas, Chase, was the fact that he's an older guy that can come in, and he is already mentoring Miguel Vargas. He's already mentoring Michael Bush. He's already playing that role of that guy that that I thought Justin Turner needed to be in terms of that mentorship guy in the infield. I think that's probably the biggest value of him right now at this moment. Would you agree with that? Maybe not the biggest value, but at least one of the biggest values of him? Yeah, I think so. And I think one of the – I mean, I, I went. I talked about this multiple times a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, getting him, he's already been – a dodger before um Mm -hmm. so that obviously i think that played a big role in getting him as well um not only to mentor him but to mentor him you know to be a dodger so i think that that's going to play you know that that's going to be huge yeah no doubt and some of his first comments that kind of give this away to me is that you know it wasn't hey i'm going to play 150 games at shortstop or this or that some of his very first comments were about miguel vargas you know a young cuban player who needs mentorship and how he's already worked with them. And and those were the type of early comments that Miguel Rojas made and that, you know, that really impressed me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that that goes to show you what kind of guy and what kind of teammate he is. You know, I that speaks volumes cuz there's not a lot of guys, you know, that are super selfless like that, especially that have had success at the major league level. Um, but I mean, maybe he knew that was his role going into you know, going through the trade and whatnot. Um, but even even if he does know that that, that was his mm-hmm. role, you know, you can tell that he's embraced it. And, you know, I think it was a good choice. Yeah, and maybe not role, but, but one of his primary roles maybe. Mm-hmm. And who knows, he may play 162 games at shortstop. Who knows? I don't think that's going to happen. But we talked about it at the time how I think that creates a path for Michael Bush to play more every day at second base and how, you know, as much as we love Jacob Amaya – and we love Michael Bush too. They're just if you just add the numbers up and add the math, there was not a path for both Michael Bush, Jacob Amaya, and then when you add Miguel Vargas, you know, there was no path right there for them all to get the three, four hundred major league at bats like they need in twenty twenty three. 
Right. Yeah. I, and I, I agree with you 100 percent. And, you know, I can't again, we, we talked about this, too. You know, I'm, I'm happy for Jake Amaya. You know, he's, mm-hmm. he's going to get his shot in Miami and, and it's a well-deserved shot. Um, you know, we want to see those guys be successful, um, you know, and, and he, he deserved to get on that field and on that, um, you know, in that stage. Um, yeah. So I'm glad he's going to get the opportunity to do so. Yeah. And here's another thing, you know, we've seen it with Trace Thompson and and guy, well, Miguel Rojas. OK, Jacob Amaya goes to Miami. He knocks it out of the park. Guess what's going to happen to him when he becomes a free agent, Chase? They're going to go back after him. Yeah, they're going to go back after him like they always <laughs> do. Right. I mean, that's not to say just because he's moving away from the Dodgers. I mean, how many times do you see it where, you know, young coaches get in the profession and they become a GA at, at the college they went to? You're familiar with that role. And then yeah. all of a sudden they move away, you know, halfway across the country to get experience everywhere else. And then where do they end up back? <laughs> right where they started, right? Right so, back home. So definitely, you know, there's a path for Jacob and my hip. And I say that because, you know, he went to South Hills High School there in West Covina. He is a local Southern California boy. His his grandpa, Frank, is a legend in that area as a coach. His dad is very prominent in the area. You know, and I know I, I've communicated with his high school coach and his dad both. And, and they're, they're Dodgers fans, and it would have been so cool to see him at Dodger Stadium. So I say that to say just because he's moved to Miami doesn't mean that Jacob Amaya won't get his day at Dodger Stadium. That's that's 100% right. Yeah, so that's a cool aspect of that. So the, the two parts of, of the Justin Turner deal, of, you know, of course they wanted $16 million and, and the Dodgers didn't think that was necessarily the market value for him, and he ended up getting a two-year deal with Boston. The two things that, that I that – were in favor of of Justin Turner were the defensive metrics. He still was one of the best defensive third basemen in the game by almost every metric you look at, and in, by some metrics and a lot of metrics, the best defense or offensive. Did I say defensive? I meant offensive third baseman in the game. Still, even last year, even after the slow start, I know he struggled in the playoffs, but even if you look at his overall playoff career, he's been better than most of the third basemen that are out there. So the offensive aspect of it, then the mentorship part of it, those were the two aspects I felt like gave Justin Turner the most value to come back to the Dodgers. So we talked about Miguel Rojas taking that mentorship as far as the infielders. Now the offensive production, okay, J.D. Martinez is going to take over that role. So the Dodgers kind of filled the Justin Turner situation with two different guys, didn't they? They, they absolutely did, and I think they went about it right, and they did it right. Um, you know, and I think that I think that you're going to see a jump um, in JD Martinez's performance uh, from last year, and that's not even to say that it was a, a bad performance because I think I mean he hit somewhere in the mid twos if I remember correctly. Um, you know, but one thing that I noticed when I was going through his stats and things like that is every time that he changes organizations, mm-hmm. he shows some improvement from the year prior. Um, and then not to mention, I think you said that he's reunited with the hitting coach that kind of, you know, Robert Van Skoyak. Yep. That sparked his, uh, I mean, just, just phenomenal hitting and offensive play. Um, so I think that that's going to be, you know, that's going to be huge as well. No doubt about it. And he wants to be in Los Angeles. And so really, you know, the, the two concerns I had about keeping Justin Turner when they, when they, when they did not resign him, the two, the two biggest concerns I had I really feel like the Dodgers did a fantastic job shoring up those two issues that I had with both Miguel Rojas and J.D. Martinez now that did put them over the cap in doing so, but you would have to assume that that Justin Turner would have probably as well. So, well, I mean, J.D. Martinez made $10 million. Who knows? I mean, that that's too complicated of a, of a discussion to have. We, we can have that maybe on another day. We've had those before, but... That's kind of the topic I wanted to talk to, uh, talk about today. If you have a comment on that, as far as fans go, as far as the audience goes, kind of give us your thoughts on that. But before we get any into this any further, do you have any more thoughts on that before we, we get into our Gavin Stone talk? No, I think that I think they did it. Like you said, they did it right. They went after two veteran guys that um, are going to play, are going to fill that role that Justin Turner could have had, both offensively and defensively. It's just with two separate guys. Um, you know, so I think they did it right. We'd love to love to hear from y'all. Yep. Okay. And Justin Turner got a sweet deal there at Boston. So, mm-hmm. and he's still very prominent in the LA area. I know his 
foundation is still big and, and he's still big in the LA area. So if you're concerned about, hey, well, he's from LA and he does all this work for the community, he still does all that. So really it's kind of a win-win so far. Love Rojas' defensive consistency and flexibility to pair with the offensive upside of Vargas and Bush, who are still finding defensive holes on the Major League roster. Totally agree with that. This is a perfect mix, and, and Rojas is going to have that mentality, Austin. Thank you for joining Roy and Austin. Good evening, Roy, to you as well. Perfect mix between Rojas realizing, hey, we have some young rookies, so hey, if I don't play every day, great, I will take that mentorship role. That's very valuable to have a guy that I think can view it like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and something that just came to mind when you said that is, man, they don't get they don't get paid by the hour, so they're yeah. on they're on salary. So yeah. I'm sure he's going to be happy with, you know, he's going to get his bag one way or another. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough about that. Let's get to it. My man, Gavin Stone, like I said, I'm going to get to talk to him on Friday. If you have a question that you would like for me to ask in the audience of him on Friday, I will even mention your name if you want me to, but I will get that question to Gavin Stone and have him answer that. I will have that interview ready for next week. I'll redo his feature and probably release that next week as well. So without any more ado, Chase, let's – uh. Let's go ahead and get to some Gavin Stone video. What do you think? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Gavin Stone right there. This is at Great Lakes, and this is the season that, you know, a lot of people think that, well, boy, he came out of nowhere last year. No, he did not, okay? And Austin will be the first one to tell you that at the end of this season, 2021, this is the 2021 season, that pitch right there, the changeup, this is really where he mastered that pitch. And I got to talk to Gavin oh, about this time last year, and he said, you know what, by the end of 2021, he wasn't sure that his changeup wasn't his best pitch in his arsenal. And keep in mind, Chase, he hit 98 that year in 2021. So he didn't come out of nowhere, man. He had a lot of momentum coming out of that season and into last season. Yeah, he definitely did. And if you guys are watching this film and some of these – some of these um, off-speed pitches that he's throwing, man, that changeup, it, it's it's one of a kind. It's a really, mm-hmm. really good pitch. Um, and then the bender, too. The bender is, is nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really like you know his posture. I like his tilt. I like his uh, his Like that changeup there? <laughs> that's, that's really, really good. Um, you know, and this, this is just going to show you how – how effective you know he, he's going to be um yeah this is in double a and triple a um but man these these are professional hitters um and and they're getting Michael paid Bush. To, they're getting paid to play too so uh yeah i mean i think he's going to be effective even with the big club yeah no doubt about it another thing about him is that he was a closer at uca and a starter both uca being university of central arkansas so he's you know, if the you know we've talked about the Dodgers have the five starters with, and if I leave one out, fans, I, correct me and tell me who I'm leaving out here. You have Dustin May and Noah Syndergaard, Julio Urias, Clayton Kershaw, and then who is the fifth one that I'm leaving out there, guys? You have your five starters there, and then you have the five rookies with Bobby Miller, Ryan Pepio, Gavin Stone, Michael Grove, and Andre Jackson. Andre Jackson is uh, is still considered a rookie so that's 10 guys that are starters you can't start 10 guys so the rookies you would imagine are going to have to at least go to the pen at least some right and gavin stone has been a closer at uca so he has experience doing both yeah and and speaking from a pitcher's perspective um you know it's hard to change roles um especially in the middle of the year um Coming out of the bullpen is a completely different mindset than a starter. Um, the way you pitch is different. Um, yeah. Your mentality is different. Um, you know, really, really, you're just your total approach to the game is is not even close to the same. You know, as a starter, you're you're taught to pace yourself. You're taught to, you know, hold on hold on to your best stuff until you got to use it. Um, only burn only burn it in there when you have to. Um, and then when when you're a reliever and especially a closer, man, it's it's a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time, mm-hmm. you know, because you're only going, you know, one, two, three innings, um, as opposed to a starter when you're going maybe four, five, and even six. Um, yeah, it's it's completely different, and I think that him knowing, um, him having that experience in both roles is going to be huge. 
Yep. Kind of to add to my point, Austin was talking about this. Austin Brubaker gets to go to a lot of Great Lakes games. He got to see Gavin Stone quite a bit at the end of 2021. He got to see him at West Michigan, and he noticed that wicked uh, movement on the changeup there in West Michigan in 2021. He was different than a lot of other pitchers, Austin says, and you could sense the excitement for him around the team, no doubt about that. Roy Estrada is Gavin mentally and physically ready for the big leagues. I will say this, he is one absolutely cool customer. He does not let anything bother him. I mean, sometimes, you know, like his teammates will tease him like, like, hey, do you even have a heartbeat? I mean, it's like he is just so chill. It's like nothing, absolutely nothing bothers him. He threw the no-hitter at UCA. He was also a closer. He is absolutely made for clutch moments. Of course, you never quite know until they hit the major leagues exactly how they handle the 55,000 people in the stands and all the scrutiny and all that. But I can tell you, of any young prospect that I have seen from a mental perspective, I think Austin would agree with this, he is as mentally prepared and mentally ready as anybody that I have seen, and that's why he has been so good, because he just approaches. You know, there was a game this year, he went a long stretch where he was just completely dominant, and he gave up like a couple of home runs in the first couple of innings. And what a lot of young – Chase, you know this – what a lot of young pitchers do when they struggle for the first time in a while, guess what they want to do? They want to try to throw it harder, right? They want to yeah, try to throw it through a – yeah. Okay, try well – Try to press, and, and you, usually it's it's kind of a recipe for disaster when, they, yep. when that happens. <laughs> well, in that scenario, he threw a changeup, a slider, a changeup, and then like another – I can't remember the – but it was like all off speed. And the next hitter was out in like four pitches. And it was like, okay, I'm sold <laughs> right there. You know, yeah. the dude just knows how to pitch. So to answer Roy's question, no doubt about it, he is as ready as he possibly can be mentally and physically. And which veteran pitcher does he turn to for mentoring? Roy Estrada asked that. I think if you look at his mentality, of course, he's right handed, not left handed. But if you just look at the way that he stays calm, the way that he stays under control, I think his mannerisms are going to remind you very much so of Clayton Kershaw. I was about to say the, the exact same thing. You know, the way they the, the way that they approach the game, the way that they pitch is so similar. Um, you know, and, and yeah, one's right-handed, one one's left-handed, but just that cool kind of calmness and you know, just just overall like kind of mm-hmm. quiet, soft-spoken kind of guy. Um, you know, that just goes out there and does his job is exactly what Kershaw's done. And that's why he's, I mean, that's why he's made, you know, made his living. And that's why he's been so successful. Um, yeah, no, he, no he doubt. Knows how to knows how to handle failure. And, um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a huge part of, of pitching. You know, there's a lot of times where you are going to fail because pitching is really, really, really hard. Um, you know, and when they're, when they're yes, able to remain calm. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, I said yes, no doubt. I was totally agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah, it's You're, it's it, that it's going to be a key component to his game, especially once he gets on the big stage. Yeah, I think uh, you know of all the talent, you know, he's believe it or not, he was the Dodgers minor league pitcher of the year. So it's hard to say that he's flown under the radar. But for somebody who has had those accolades, he kind of has flown under the radar because you have Bobby Miller, who's hitting 102. You know. And then, and then you 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 had Ryan Pepio and Michael Grove make their major league debuts this past season. So, although Gavin Stone actually was the best pitcher in the entire organization last year, it just kind of seems like he was a little bit under the radar in terms of the exposure of it, and that's just fine for him. He came from Lake City, Arkansas, which is a smaller town, and I know you know Coach Harlan there at UCA, Chase, and I know you love recruiting your players to UCA because Coach Harlan's such a wonderful pitching coach, and I know he does just does a great job there. And when you ask Coach Harlan about Gavin Stone, you know the first five minutes he talks about Gavin will be absolutely nothing about pitching. He's going to talk about the type of teammate he is, how the players. You mentioned this a lot, Chase. How the players behind him want to play behind Gavin Stone. Yeah, and that, and that, you know when. It's easier to pitch when you feel like you have guys behind you. Um, so that definitely leads to his success as well. And, you know, him being liked in the locker room and in the uh, the clubhouse makes him that much more comfortable. Yeah, and he is unquestionably, unquestionably a leader when he is on the field, 
off the field. He he is a guy that, you know, there's different ways to lead. Some guys like to rah-rah. Some guys like to get in your face. Some guys like to get you pumped up. Other guys lead by example. He is yeah, that and, guy that leads by example. Absolutely. You know, and that, that goes back to his kind of quiet, you know, quiet personality, his soft-spoken mental, uh, personality. Um, you know, one thing that I can say with my encounters with, with Coach Harlan up the, uh, down there in you know, Central Arkansas, you know, is, is he – he likes to recruit the guys that are just like Gavin Stone, you know, mm-hmm. guys that, you know, have a have a, a respect for the game, have a, you know, just just have that that right mentality, um, you know, and, and the culture down there is, is something that's that's pretty special. Um, and, and he's a pure I mean, he, he's he's just a cutout of what happens at Central Arkansas. No doubt about it. OK, so Austin Brubaker, this is getting to my next comment. Had a chance to sit directly behind the home plate while Gavin was pitching this year. He said the movement he gets on all of his pitches, not just his changeup, all of his pitches is insane. He has that kind of, you know, there's two ways to create ride with your fastball. You can hit the top of the zone and give it that rising effect. And you can also hit the bottom of the zone with it and carry it. You know, because when you throw it to the bottom of the zone, it looks like the hitter is going to continue to tumble out of the zone. But if you have good spin rate, instead of dropping out of the zone, it carries the bottom of that zone and it kind of shocks the hitter into a lot like right there, into not swinging because it's a strike that they were expecting to be low in the zone. Gavin Stone is the master at that, at, at creating the carry at the bottom of the zone, that right at the top of the zone. And then, you know, it kind of had like that change up there, but it's fastball kind of has a two seam movement to it where it has, you know, just that slight late break slight probably not the right way to say it but it has that late explosive break that gets away from your barrel yeah man he and and it's it's cool that austin says that you know when you watch him pitch there's a lot a lot of bite not only to his uh, or i'm sorry not only to his curveball or his changeup, his fastball you know like you said it has that two seam movement has that two seam bite and Mm -hmm. it happens so late you know like so late um, so that that's hard for hitters to make adjustments to, um, you know. I and I, I would always taught you know if you can make the ball move and you can command the zone, you're better off doing that than you are throwing you know 105 <laughs> and, and yeah. throwing it straight and flat. Now notice he just threw three balls in a row and then he came right back with three challenge pitches. That's the kind of pitcher he he threw. He knew he got down in the zone, so instead of you know like a young hitter trying to press, he just threw the ball in strike zone and played the odds and said, hey. If if you if you fail seven out of ten times a hitter, you're a Hall of Famer, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to walk you, and I'm going to make you hit this ball. I threw three just good pitches in a row and got the out. Okay, so statistically, this year in 2023, Gavin Stone, again, the Dodgers minor league pitcher of the year, ERA 1.48. Okay, on the season, he had – all right, on the season, he had 168 strikeouts and 121.2 innings, Chase. Okay, so you're talking about more than nine. What, what would that be, like 10, 11 strikeouts a game? And then he <laughs> yeah, he, he walked 44. So his strikeout-to-walk ratio was close to 3 to 1. You want it to be, oh, about 2.5 to 1 above that, which it certainly was that. His strikeout rate is very good. You know, I think he could probably be the first one to tell you that three walks a game – a little more than three walks a game, he could probably lower that a little bit. So if you're going to nitpick Gavin Stone, that would probably be it. Maybe reduce it down to about two walks a game. Keep the strikeout rate where it's at with, again, 168 strikeouts, 121.2 innings. Average against was 206. His whip was 1.12, and that is through an entire season, 121.2 innings. And they shut him down pretty good towards the, the end of the season. His He had a big time – innings countdown towards the end of the year so some of his his performances towards the end of the year weren't quite as long yeah and that i mean that that stat line is is pretty crazy um you know if you ask me especially at a professional level um you know, like i said it, it just goes to show you what kind of pitcher he is man he's a high quality guy um that's going to find a lot of success um you know where, wherever he's at whether that be you know, in AAA, or, or I think, I mean, even even with the the big club in LA, um, he's going to find a lot of success. Um, people in the chat, talk to us if you have any questions. Feel yep, free to no, chime in. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah, Gavin Stone. Okay, 
one definitely one of my favorite pitchers. And again, I got to see him quite a bit. He, it's you know I'm, I'm going to kind of circle back to one of the comments I made earlier. Is you know a lot of people had this perception that he kind of came out of nowhere last year, and that's not the case. You know we talked about 2021. He was hitting 98 with the fastball, and then. You know, he had that change up that he was developing. And so he just kind of carried that in. This is the end of 2021 that you're seeing right here. Carried that into 2022. Statistically, one of the best pitchers in the minor leagues last year. Advanced metri- uh, advanced metrics back up the unreal ERA, too. You know, there's statistics. And then you kind of have peripherals, Chase. You know, in other words, like, okay, yeah, the ERA was good, but did they get lucky? Did, did, did a defensive guy make a diving catch? You know, did – did they just uh, – three or four situations that a guy just miss a ball and hit a pop-up instead of a home run, that kind of deal. So there's peripheral-type statistics that will kind of give an organization the idea of, well, yeah, the ERA and stuff was good, but, yeah, he was drafted in the fifth round and in the 2020 draft that only had five rounds. So, okay, was it was it a fluke or was it absolutely legit? And when you look at the peripherals for – Gavin Stone, they all they all indicate that everything that he did, the ridiculous ERA that he had, was all – none of it was a fluke. It was all earned, and it was all just absolutely legit. Yeah, and, I, man, I don't, I, as a pitcher, I don't really like those statistics. To me, an out and out. An out, and out I agree. You know? If I get an out, then, then I beat the hitter, um, and he beat the hitter a whole heck of a lot of times last year. Um, so he deserves every bit of credit. Uh, for the performance and the numbers that he put up last year. Yep. Another thing that he does really well, and you'll see this, as you see it, there's that two seam at the bottom of the zone that he carries very, very well. He's one of the better pitchers that I've seen, you know, so much anymore. They're teaching hitter, uh, pitchers to use that, that spin rate at the top of the zone to get that right effect because, you know, you have that slight lift in these swings nowadays and it gets right above that swing at the top of the zone. But – Gavin Stone is one of the better pitchers I have seen at using the bottom of the zone still to his advantage, and I think that's because of the movement he gets. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, kind of a kind of a guy that, you know, I, th- I think that you can make a living at the bottom of the zone. Mm-hmm. Um, right there. Yeah, you have. Uh, it, it, and right there, bottom of the zone, right there. I think it's easier to tunnel, you know, off the bottom of the yeah. zone too. It, it makes it makes pitches so much harder to right hit. Right there, you just saw a fastball changeup tunnel to the bottom of the zone, right there, and then the slider. There is your fastball slider changeup tunnel all to the bottom of the zone. Exactly what you're saying. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but I wanted to point that out. No, you're good. And and, and if you guys don't know what we mean by the the tunneling effect, it's you know you start the fastball middle middle. Um, and then you start your slider middle middle and it, it ends up outside or, you know, you start the change up, it ends up down and in, um, just kind of to go off what we're talking about. So you guys have an idea. Um, but man, he, he tunnels that, um, you know, all of his pitches off that, off that low, uh, middle to low fastball. Um, and it makes it really, really hard for hitters. One of the best qualities, if you talk to Coach Harlan from UCA, that he has is that he is absolutely a leader on the field. So, hey, I'm going to transition this back, and I'm going to give some final thought. We're going to get some final thoughts here as we get some more interaction from the fans here. As we finish up our talk, Chase, we are back live. So, hey, we've talked about Miguel Rojas, his mentorship. We've talked about J.D. Martinez, his offense, and how those two kind of combine between Miguel Rojas' mentorship, J.D. Martinez's offense, replace Justin Turner and what he would have given the Dodgers. And then we've talked about Gavin Stone. So dive into the whole thing and sum it up for us. Uh, man, again, I think the Dodgers went about it the right way. Um, after they lost Justin Turner, you know, they he had offensive – I mean, just an offensive freak. Um, you know, and then he provided that uh, that mentorship for the infielders. You know, but, you know, they just went and got two two different guys to, to fill the, those – two roles that Justin Turner could have filled probably on his own. Um, you know, but um, they went about it the right way. And then, man, I again, I can't say enough about uh, Gavin Stone. Man, he's a he's a fun guy to watch, super impressive. Um, seems like a great dude. Obviously, you know him a little bit better than I do. Um, yeah. But, man, he, he's, he's a special player, special pitcher. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and his favorite barbecue restaurant is Ray's Rump Shack. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love a guy who who loves going to Ray's Rump Shack, right? I mean, good grief. <laughs> hey, and by the way, by the way, another thing. Hey, good evening, Mike. It's great to see you. Uh, better late than never. We just got through with our Gavin Stone talk, our video talk. So if you want to see that, go back and 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 check that out at a later date. And also, we played for Buster Campbell. I know you co- know Coach Campbell, a, a, a Hall of Famer in Arkansas. I believe he's the winningest coach in Arkansas basketball history. And and every time he goes back home to Lake City, he goes and has lunch with Coach Campbell. How cool is that? <laughs> that that's awesome man and and it's cool to have those special relationships with those coaches that have that have impacted you in that kind of way um and to carry that relationship on is something something really special yeah no doubt about it mike says he thinks stone is going to stand out over all the young pitchers who come up and that includes bobby miller that includes ryan pepio michael grove and andre jackson so that's a big statement to make so what do you say to that chase uh, man, I, I I I think he's right. Uh, yeah, you know. But I also think that I also think that the other uh, the other young guys are going to surprise you too. I think they're going to be they're all going to be special, man. And and I hope I hope that we can hang on to all of them. Um, I know it's going to be hard, um, but man, they're all just so stinking good. Um, it, it's no it's doubt. just hard to say. It's an embarrassment of riches, soul bro. Where you been, man? We've been missing you. The last couple of shows, I appreciate the comment, the great stuff, guys, comment. We appreciate all the comments you leave. Fernando, can't wait to see Stone and Miller up with Los Angeles. Man, think about this. You already have the five guys. I have a phone call coming. I'm going to turn that off. Hey, that's a good phone call. You know what that's telling me, Chase? No school tomorrow. Oh, you lucky <laughs> is, dog. Yeah, it's snowing in Oklahoma. And other than the, <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good phone call to get right there. But, hey. You know, you have the five guys with Kershaw, Yadias, May, and uh, uh, Syndergaard, and Gonsolin. Gonsolin, the one I keep missing. So you have the five starters, and then you have the five rookies with Pepio, Grove, Miller, Stone, and then Jackson still. So, man, and then be beneath that, then you have guys like Frasso, Nick Nestrini, John Rooney, uh, Kyle Hurt. Alec Gamboa, then, you know, you have, I mean, so, you know, Cole Percival that has five pitches. I mean, it is just absolutely a complete embarrassment of riches. Yeah, it's, it, and it's, I love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. Um, you know, hey, by the way, guys, keep keep commenting. We're loving it. Yeah, we um, got about, oh, about th- two inches of snow, maybe. What? Not a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, but it's like 30, it was above freezing, so it didn't stick. Oh, well, I, I'm annoyed because all it did out here was rain for a little bit, and then it mm-hmm. snowed for about an hour. Then it all disappeared. So, yeah. And we're only, what, 30 minutes 30 minutes apart? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point Fernando made. Kershaw will be limited, you know, and, and probably so will Dustin May coming off of Tommy John. And then Noah Syndergaard's coming off as Tommy John from 2020. And then also Tony Gonsolin's been injury prone. And – Julio Urias threw more innings last year than he had in any other year. So there's a lot of innings you would have to think to be had. We say the five starters, but you would have to think between those five starters, there's going to be a lot of innings like Fernando is saying that are going to be available for the other guys. Yeah, it, it absolutely. Um, there's there's going to be roles that have to be filled, you know, and you, you want to take care of those older guys too, maybe to prolong their career. Sure. Um, you know, and – and, and to have all of these young prospects, you know, you want to see as many of them on the big stage as you can. Um, and I think they can all give you a good chance to win. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you see Kershaw going much over 100 innings this year? <sighs> if he does, it won't be by a lot. Um, I could see him probably staying around the 90 range. Uh, yeah. If, you well, know. Go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just reading. I was getting, I was just reading Soul Brother. I'm oh, sorry. No, no, you're good. I, you know, just, just with his age, um, I'm not sure how – uh, how he could go much more than that and continue to stay healthy. Um, I hope I, I I really hope that you know he he stays around that ninety mark and we get to see some of the uh, some of the younger guys. Yeah, especially seeing how with the expanded playoffs, all you got to do is make it. You know, I mean, it's not like there's only two teams from the National League getting in. All you got to do is win 
85, 90 games you're in, right? Right. Okay, so right. you have the ability to do that, and we've seen that the home field advantage isn't what it's all made out to be. Here's another aspect that that Solbro brought up. Great point. Kershaw is always already also pitching in the World Baseball Classic. So add those innings to his total. So, so you know, I mean, I think the hundred inning mark would be a lot for Kershaw, maybe, right? Yeah, that man, that's a heavy load. That's a lot of innings and a lot of pitches on a on a on an older arm. Um, you know, and we want nothing but to see that guy healthy and yep. and performing at you know his best, like he has been for for many years. Yeah, no doubt about it. And then, and then, yeah. So, okay, thoughts on how well May will pitch this year? The thing about Tommy Johns is, and I've talked to almost every pitcher I've talked to in the minor leagues for the Dodgers that they've almost all had Tommy John. And the first thing I say is, hey, it doesn't hurt. Doesn't it? Just doesn't feel the same. So. I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen with Dustin May this year. I don't think there's going to be any pain or anything like that. But I don't think anybody knows how long it's going to take just or Dustin May to get back to feeling the pitches like he used to. Yeah, um, you know, we're especially working with guys that have come off Tommy John. Um, it's a long process. It's not just you know what you hear about in that you know in that twelve months or that thirteen months when you're finally able yeah. to get back on the mound and go full go. Um, there, there's so much more to you, – you have to get comfortable again. You have to trust that your arm's not going to give out again. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to trust that you know that that you healed correctly, that the doctor did the right things. There, there's a lot that goes into it, and it's it's scary. Um, I can't mm-hmm. even imagine, you know, being being an older, you know, professional baseball player where, you know, I've made my living off throwing a baseball for several years now, and then, you know, that all could come to an end really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's a scary thought. So it it takes it takes a lot longer than just that twelve or thirteen months when you are finally able to get back on the mound and go full go. So you have that situation with both May and Cindergard. So I think there's a lot of question marks there. But but you know, hey, if everything works out, we got a minute left here, and you know the five guys, boy, that's a pretty darn good staff. Probably the best, one of the best in baseball. Final yeah. thoughts, Chase. We got about a minute, less than a minute. There, there's a lot of good stuff going on, you know, in, just in the uh, the whole Dodgers organization, you know, from from pitchers to hitters to um, defensive play, man, everything, everything is lining up really, really well, um, mm-hmm. you know, and I I was nervous, you know, going, kind of going into the, the free agency period and all that stuff, um, you know, and then just seeing, you know, what the Dodgers were going to do to trade, um, but they did it right. Yep. Hey, fans, just a reminder, leave a comment. I know we had this this chat, but if you leave a comment, that helps this video get seen. Also, share this video, like this video, tell all your friends about Dodgers Dogs and Dodgers Daily so we can keep growing and keep providing you content like this in the future. As always, fans, thanks for tuning in, and go Dodgers.